Hello, everybody. Welcome to Arsenal X, NGR's Xbox podcast. As always, we throw up the X because we're about to do down. I am your host, Eddie V. Thank you guys for tuning in. Joining me is my wise Wisconsinite, Mr. Jesse Douglas. Me? <laughs> <laughs> and he's back. My boss man. My one and only brother from another mother yes or from the supermarket whatever comes first oh jeez no, mr man. Corey derrick hi boss welcome back yay, yay. hey oh, i missed it i missed this i missed it <laughs> i missed it especially because i've been playing a lot of xbox games lately like really <laughs> diving into stuff and it's not yes. destiny 2 so <laughs> we can talk about other games yay well, look, How's everybody doing uh, before we get to what's our arsenal? Jack uh, for life. Yes. <laughs> I'm doing good also. <laughs> he oh, said Jack Straps for life. No, yes. that's going to be the new Arsenal X t shirt. It's just going to be a Jack Strap that says. <laughs> with the, <laughs> with the Xbox life. logo on it. Oh, yeah. please. You know what? I'm going to look for that after we get off the podcast. The Xbox Jack Strap. So oh, I can get man. one. Oh man, I have a lot of work to do tomorrow when I'm off and we record Pow Block tomorrow, Ed. I'm going to be. I already updated the front page of the website. I got to do website stuff and I got to do t shirt stuff. Those are the t- two things I got to do tomorrow. Yes. Oh, I'm so excited. Awesome. So excited. Well, I am doing really good too. Nobody uh, has to, though. Oh. Okay. Ed, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Yes. There's a lot of stuff happening this weekend, but this past weekend, uh, it was such a struggle just to get through. But did a lot of gaming. Um, was was just happy to podcast with other people and stuff like that. Um, it just uh, me and um, Jesse and his friend Ben. We did some Halo Five, talking about just different things. Had fun playing that co-op. That on Halo Five was really good. But that's gonna be more in, in what's our arsenal. So Corey, I'm actually gonna start with you. Uh, what's been in your arsenal? What you been playing? Oh geez, I've been playing on Xbox. I've been playing. I have been playing Destiny Two, but I've been playing a lot of Gears of War Four again. And yeah. I have to tell you, man, Gears of War is <laughs> such a mechanically sound game, such a such a polished piece of work, and it just every time I play it, I like I always play it, and I always say, man, this is a time I'm going to get back into Gears because I was really into Gears One and Two. Like, <laughs> I played probably more Gears of War One and Two than I have of Destiny, and you guys know how much Destiny I've played. Like I I loved Gears of War so much, and I actually uh, played with some of my old friends that I used to actually try to play like competitive with, and it was fun jumping back in with them. Uh, and so, you know, I played I played a ton of Gears of War multiplayer. Man, it's so good. It's so good. And like the last time I played must have been like around Christmas last year because I have the snowman all the snowman skins for my guns. <laughs> and like my <laughs> snub pistol is it has wrapping paper on it. So it's like god man, I can't believe it's been that long since I played that game. Uh and then I played Halo 5 and also a very solid polished game. Like I know We talked a little bit about this on NGR, uh, but, like, Microsoft, even though they don't have any, like, big games coming out now or have had, not trouble, but, you know, have had some work cut out for them in terms of producing new IP or reinventing old IP, you can't deny the work that 343 and the Coalition have done to polish these games and how 
beautiful they look and how well they play and how tight they feel when you're controlling the characters like these games are some of the best playing games i think i've ever played outside of nintendo games like halo 5 the movement feels so good it's fast but it's fast but you still feel like you're in control you know like the boosts like when you're jumping to pl from platform to platform or you're dodging out of the way or you're just spreading around the map shooting guys like those weapons feel so good and going from destiny which is very slow kind of you know you can i mean it, it's not a not a secret destiny is slow very deliberate in where you're shooting you know kind of hiding and popping out whereas halo is very fast paced they want you to move around the map they want you to jump to higher places the maps are yeah. very vertical and very like okay i need to i need to strafe while i'm shooting these guys it, which actually helps when you're not aiming down sights which is my favorite thing about halo is that you don't have to aim down sights it feels so good <laughs> Uh, you know, it's it's just that. And then Ed, we've talked about this over the last couple of weeks. Three four three, real like say what you will about Halo Five story, and I've been a big advocate of how bad the story is and how mm -hmm. thrown together it feels. But the level design, ah, oh, superb. Like that dude. team, and I know it's the Halo team from Bungie. Like most of them moved to three four three. Like uh, for people who don't know, Bungie kind of split in half when micro when bungie left uh microsoft to become independent and the people who wanted to keep working on halo went with 343 like frank o'connor and uh what's her what's her name uh i want to say it's betty something but i forget what her name is i'm sorry it's gonna bother me all day uh but then the other half went to work on destiny which was like Luke Smith and, and all those guys, you know, it kind of just yeah. split in half. And which, by the way, read an interesting article today from, uh, who was it? Gosh, I'm losing my mind today. I can't remember any of this stuff. <laughs> but it was uh, one of the founders of Bungie, and they're already thinking about their next project. They're already starting pre-production on their next project when Destiny's over. Which got me really excited. Because I want to know what that is. But anyways. Anyways, Bungie kind of split in half. And half became 343 to work on Halo. And the other half stayed Bungie to work on Destiny. But you can really see like the classic Halo level design. And as they evolved the movement of the Spartans. The levels became less linear and more vertical. And you could you see yourself climbing up to these higher spots. To get better vantage points. Or you know it's just it's just really awesome level design and so is gears they open it up it's more like open area in halo 5 yeah yeah it's just uh halo halo is still super fun to play and i can't wait to play co-op with you guys what what do we decide next weekend this week some point at some point uh yeah i think that uh yeah this week yeah, yeah. Because so. technically, yeah, this comes out on Wednesday. So, yeah, this week. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. It's going to be so fun. <laughs> I'm, so like, I'm so and excited. It's, and it's so yeah, weird. And I was, because... Oh, go ahead, Jesse. I was watching you guys play the other day, and it was that's the one thing about it. I, I was saying that it's it's one of those games that's fun even to watch people play. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, you know, when you're playing the story mode. So, yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to playing with you guys and trying it out. So, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely it's definitely a game people should not overlook. You know, I still think in terms of of the way Halo plays, I think Halo Four is actually the best Halo game. But Halo Five, man, if they can build on that story and really mm -hmm. form a cohesive story with uh, whatever the next Halo game is, I'm assuming Halo Six is going to be the next game. You know, and then bringing the two teams together, like I actually replayed the campaign. And, like, at the end when the two teams kind of... Spoilers, I'm sorry. It's two years old. You should play it by now. The teams kind of, like, come together. And, like, you see, like, the Spartan 4s with the Spartan 2s. And, like, you can just kind of see where... Okay, Halo 6 is going to have Locke and Chief kind of fighting together. And then you'll have Buck and probably Linda or, or you know, some of the other Spartans. It's just going to be 
cool to see them kind of come together and you're kind of like I could almost see them doing eight player co-op at some point and like Ooh. like like really just blowing it out and saying all right look we've done four player co-op we're going to expand it since it's two teams of four Spartans right and you just bring them together and do an eight player co-op or something oh, yeah oh, I could totally see that because I would I don't mind Locke as a character. I just don't want to play as Locke in a numbered Halo game, right? But I I like him as like a character. He's kind of like, you know, the straightforward military guy and like which plays really well with his and Buck's relationship, which is the character played by Nathan Fillion. Like he's kind of like obviously he's Nathan Fillion plays the same character and everything. He's kind of like the the smart mouth kind of, you know, jokey character. And then Locke's kind of like the straightforward military dude. And, like, there's never really been that character that plays off the serious characters in Halo, really. Mm -hmm. You know, Halo has always kind of, you know, been very good at telling a very serious story. And then the things that happen within the game are the funny things. Like, when you apply the birthday skull to the grunts and you headshot them and they explode into confetti. Like, that's funny, you know. (laughs) But the story itself is kind of contained in this kind of serious thing. So... Replaying Halo 5 really made me excited for a Halo 6 and what they could possibly do with this game. Oh, please. It, it, please it's, so, it's so weird revisiting this game or like definitely for me playing it for the first time. It kind of opened up a lot of people's eyes and just be like, man, this game, it, it, ho- it holds up in certain ways. Mm-hmm. But it's still a, like a really good game. Yeah, and it definitely like it's a game that I was really excited for when it came out, and mm-hmm. all the hype around it. Like in in playing through it, I was disappointed because the story wasn't great, and I was really disappointed. But revisiting it and kind of knowing, like I knew the story already, I kind of knew how I felt about the gameplay already, and just going in and playing it from that perspective again really made the game a better experience for me you know it it, i knew what i was getting into the gameplay felt fun the guns feel great the promethean weapons yes the promethean weapons in particular (laughs) feel amazing to use the scatter shot is amazing the uh the line rifle is really good like the 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 what's the pistol the pistol like the burst shot pistol from the prometheans is really cool like all the weapons just feel really good. They feel better than the weapons do in Destiny. Mm-hmm. Like they feel more powerful. You feel more of like a, not like a like when the controller rumbles, you feel the kick of the weapons in your hand. But the weapons yeah. don't really. It still has that classic Halo feel where the weapons don't really kick the way that Destiny w- weapons do. You know, especially mm-hmm. like shotguns and stuff. You can still yes. run straight forward and kind of blast through guys, which feels really good. Halo is just a really good game, and people should not overlook Halo 5, especially now with all these free trials for Game Pass. It's on Game Pass. You know, uh, you could probably buy it cheap for, like, 10 or 12 bucks somewhere uh, used. Like, it's... Man, I cannot... Like, I was really down on Halo 5 when I played it at first, but revisiting it now, it's just like, man, people should really play Halo 5. Oh. Yeah, I I just picked it up digitally and I only paid twenty bucks for it. So yeah, yeah, because it's twenty bucks at stores. Yeah. So. so yeah. So yeah, it's it's definitely worth twenty bucks. Yeah. It's well worth twenty bucks. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's awesome. I I cannot say enough good things about how good Halo feels to play. Uh, and like, man, the cutscene at the beginning. Like yeah. I, I remember talking to you about it, and then just rewatching it on my big screen TV, like with ga- See, with that's... vibrant with vibrant game mode on. I was just like, I wish I was at your house watching it. Yeah. yeah, well, when you guys were playing yesterday, and I was watching it, and I have uh, I think like a fifty-five, sixty-inch. Uh-huh. And then uh, I have surround sound on, so it was, <laughs> so I, yeah, it was pretty pretty fun to watch yeah and i'm just like holy crap this looks good and then there's a scene towards the middle of the campaign where like chief and blue team kind of meet up with Locke's team and they kind of get in that 
like, you know, they're like kind of punching each other and stuff. And uh, it's just, man, the graphics in this game, you cannot tell the cutscenes from the graphics in terms of like when, like when a cutscene plays in engine versus a cutscene that plays in like, you know, the spiced up version of the engine and then the the cutscenes that play from blur the animation mm-hmm. studio like they all feel cohesive in a way that like when you watch them you just like sometimes you can't really tell which one you're watching that's how great this game looks <laughs> and it's just like man man kayla's good yes oh. so uh anything wrecked, else Corey? getting wrecked in multiplayer though Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. but the speed of Halo multiplayer has made me way better at Destiny's multiplayer because <laughs> it's so <laughs> slow. <laughs> Holy crap, dude! Moving from <laughs> moving from Halo 60 frames a second, million miles an hour arena-based multiplayer to control in Destiny at very slow 30 frames a second, like you know, just we're going to the point. We're playing control. We're going to be trudging along to be it's like man <laughs> this is this is slow but anyways yeah halo is really good uh gears is really good let's see what else i've been playing i played um oh i played trials fusion which was free last month i think for games of gold or two months ago or something mm-hmm. uh i've gotten really addicted to that again where i was really addicted <laughs> to trials hd on xbox live arcade for 360 <laughs> yeah me too and it's just like it's just one of those games where you're just like i don't really have to think about this real hard but it's still really fun and if you mess up you just hit the restart button and go again and it's just like that feels really good uh what a, i i re-downloaded assassin's creed syndicate i haven't played it yet but i re-downloaded it because i never finished it because i had played three four in unity back to back to back right before uh syndicate came out and i played about three hours of syndicate and i was so burned out on assassin's creed at that point and they changed all the controls from three four in unity for climbing to the point where i was just really frustrated with it and just didn't play past like maybe the second hour third hour uh so I re-downloaded that because I want to give that game another chance, especially with Origins coming out. Uh, yeah. And I, I probably won't finish it. I'll probably play like five or ten hours of it and be done. But I I liked the idea of that steampunky kind of train heist Assassin's Creed. Like, I got the same feeling with that story the same way I felt about the pirate the pirate stuff for 4. Right, it's just this really cool, weird kind of take on the series. That's not, oh, let's trudge through another uh, European, old European city. You know, this was like trains are cool. Uh, you know, the brick roads of the of London are cool. Like the the uh, horse and buggy kind of chase things are cool. You know, so I do want to play that again, and then. Uh, Finally, I've been playing NBA 2K18 on Switch, uh, and yes. it actually <laughs> runs really well. I was quite surprised. Uh, I thought 30 frames a second was going to hinder the sports experience, especially because FIFA runs at a crisp 60 uh, on Switch. But 2K delivered, man. This game is just like the PS4 version. It just runs at 30 frames a second instead of 60, and the detail in the players is not quite as clean as the ps4 version but everything else is there right your creative player your uh my league stuff the even the crazy microtransaction stuff is all there man the franchise mode is fully intact they delivered the full package and i am quite impressed with this game now it takes up like 14 gigs on my memory card (laughs) but i mean i mean they said they were delivering the whole experience and that's what i expected you know i expected it to fill up a lot of space and they they delivered man i'm quite impressed it is a very solid portable version of the game now i would 
I, if you are not planning on playing this in portable mode at all, I would still recommend getting the Xbox One or PS4 version, whichever console you prefer. Uh, yes. But if you want a solid portable basketball game, same thing I said about FIFA, right? Like, you know, I played I played the crap out of FIFA when you were here, Ed. Like, yes, that is an amazing portable version of FIFA. But if you want the the like the best looking experience, I would look to Xbox One or PS4. But if you want a solid portable version of the game, like it is the best you're gonna get. It's awesome. I've been playing the crap yes. out of it in bed. I've just been like laying in bed. Like... <laughs> <laughs> I suck at it though. Let me tell you. <laughs> you was winning games when I was there. No, uh, uh, NBA. Oh man, I kill it in FIFA. Man, slide tackle pass score. That's, that's my, that's my FIFA. It's my FIFA. <laughs> oh. Well, Jesse, uh, what's been in your arsenal? Um, like kind of like I said earlier, been. Uh, playing some uh, Master Chief Collection and playing some Halo 2 and I did you know I do play the uh, multiplayer uh, here and there quite a bit lately because I do like going back to some of those old maps Uh in uh, Halo 2 and 3 Uh, it's still my favorite uh, for multiplayer maps but um, and then watching, watching some Halo 5 and I did play Excuse me. I did play uh, some online play of Halo Five and stuff too, and I I do I I have to agree the the guns are just amazing in that game. I, yes. I just I just love how unique a lot of the newer ones look and just yeah the way the way they handle and everything it's just so much nicer. Like I I loved you know old old school Halo, but. They definitely did do a good job uh, upgrading all that stuff and kind of bringing it to modern days a little bit better and stuff. So, I do want to um, say the Prome- the Promethean stuff or the right, yeah, the Promethean stuff, right? That's what they're called, right? Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. The like they remind me so much of Metroid Prime that I want three four three to make a Metroid Prime game. Oh, but I mean, I know that's never going to happen, but like, I want them to take that design and put it into Metroid Prime, like uh, the orange glow and like just the design of the uh, just sorry. I just I just just, it makes me (laughs) want a Metroid Prime that's kind of like Halo. Oh, so good. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, obviously there's a there's a lot of really cool and unique things that that they came up with with the halo franchise and and you know they loved it so much that they carried it over to destiny i mean they you know there there's like playing playing halo again and stuff it's just like oh that's in destiny oh that's in destiny (laughs) <laughs> that's in destiny mm-hmm. <laughs> you know because it's like so just they they have their own unique you know change on it like instead of the ghost you have the you know the the things you drive in destiny and it's basically just a ghost yeah. you know it, it so i mean there you know so many things about the each game are so so similar that that you can't help but just be like you know laugh but then uh what else oh and then on i was playing some rare replay yesterday too yeah so, so we, were, <laughs> we were getting our butts kicked and uh but we were playing perfect dark zero oh. and no <laughs> oh, man so bad at that game i think i got like seven kills <laughs> we yeah. were just we were playing like just me and my friend ben versus the uh the bots and we put i think like 15 bots or something like that and had them all on agent only so they were pretty easy <laughs> and they were kicking our butt they like the whole group of them came into our spawn and would throw uh, laptop guns on the wall or on the ceiling so then the second we spawn if we tried walking anywhere we'd just start getting shot by the laptop guns and so <laughs> like we were just getting our butts handed to but but we were we were having fun though anyways so yeah, we were playing some of the stuff on there, and uh, and then on Switch, I've I've been playing the Flame and the Flood. I played that a little bit again. Okay, did you get a better understanding of the game? Yeah. 
Ooh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. The um. So basically, what it is is you when you die, it like starts you over again, like a little bit before you died. Yeah. So there is kind of like a auto save thing, but if you're like me and when it goes back for the auto save, you're still just about to die anyways from starvation. You basically have to start over again anyways. Wow. <laughs> so yeah, I had to end up starting over again and did a little bit better, right? Like as of last time I played it, I got, I was on an Island that I had went to before and I was looking around, but it, it changed, like the environment changes a little bit, I think with every time that you play it, uh huh. like there might be different things on it or whatever on that Island. So like, uh, the one I went to, I, uh, there was a boar there and he, uh, started attacking me until I died because <laughs> I didn't have wow. anything to attack him with. And then, uh, I, p- I just recently picked up, uh, I'm having a break. I can't remember. But what's it called? Um, uh, Steam World Dig too. Okay. And, I, and I've been playing that, and I really do enjoy that. It's it's a really good uh, um, game to just kind of pick up and and casually play and and just kind of work your way through. Because you know that's a that's a nice thing about you know a lot of the uh, the indie games and like certain games like that that have come to the Switch where. Like when you have, you know, like days like mine where I don't really get a lot of, you know, time to play games, I can just kind of pick it up and, you know, they have a lot of good games for just picking up and playing for like 15 minutes and then setting down and, you know, and you don't have to try to think, oh, what was I doing last time? Because it's basically, you know, it's easy, easy and set out enough that you kind of know what you're doing without having to try to remember so that's the one thing i do like about those a lot of those games like that so but um other than that i think that's pretty much it okay well uh i'm going to start with 3ds i've been playing steam world dig and been playing uh dragon quest 8 uh switch women legends and uh Ray, uh, Rabbits and Mario Kingdom Battle. Been working on those. Uh, picked up Yoni, Yono and the Celestial uh, Elephant. Once again, just a beautiful game. Very slow, relaxing. Um, not too much to it. It's, it's, it's very easy to pick up and play with that game. Um, haven't played anything on the PS4 chest yet, but I am going to be running through Wolfenstein. Uh, the first one, so I can get ready for Wolfenstein 2. For Xbox, uh, been playing Halo 5, and me and Ben, which is Jesse's friend, uh, we were talking and actually playing Halo 5 co-op on Heroic, (laughs) and we were getting our tails kicked. (laughs) Like, they literally took off three shots, and we were, like, dead, and... We got we got far enough that I think if we still play we would have probably ended up beating it. But uh, due to time constraints, I wasn't able to uh, play with the rest play with the rest of the guys. Um, but just a beautiful game. Halfway done with it, I got like seven more missions to go, um, and then I'll be done with it. Uh, but Halo Five is a really good game to revisit. It's like really great. Uh, been playing the Turing Test. Uh, it's a free game for Xbox Live Gold. Uh, it's a kind of a logic puzzle game in space. Uh, uh, really fun to play. The puzzles are go from easy to it really makes you think, but none of them are hard at this moment. Uh, there's like seven chapters to it, and I'm like on chapter three, about to go into four. So. Uh, I'll be playing, finishing that game up as soon as I can. Uh, other than that, uh, was we played a little bit of the division and finished that up, and uh, still going through my uh, list of games. I might actually go back to Quantum Break because I need to finish that game too, but also need to finish up Doom also. So uh, that's literally been what's been in my arsenal and stuff. Uh, 
So, but with that, everybody, we're going to get to some Arsenal news, and we have a uh, so a pretty good amount to cover. Uh, like this one, uh, Gears of War Four update brings new maps, Halloween event, and uh, OX support. Fuel Depot's coming back. Yes. What? The map Fuel Depot from Gears One. It's been. It's like. It's like the second. Uh, most noticeable map in Gears franchise besides Gridlock is Fuel Depot, and they're bringing it back. I'm so excited. <laughs> Sorry, I got really excited. I just I love Fuel Depot, man. There's like this little that there's like this uh kind of big kind of garage in the middle of the map, and you mm-hmm. start you start like at each end. It's a very linear map with like it's it's kind of got two points of interest in the middle which is one's like this big i guess it'd be like a hangar because it's there's a there's a helicopter on one side where there's frag grenades all the time and then inside the hangar is like the power weapon uh and then on each side there's like a little route behind the helicopter and a route behind the garage that you can go in these certain places in the back way and like Oh, I just love Fuel Depot so much because there's all these shipping <laughs> containers inside the garage yeah. that you kind of like weave in and out of to get away from fire and stuff. Oh, so good. <laughs> I love Fuel Depot, man. Well, uh, that is one of the uh, maps. Also, Lift Apex will also be one of the maps. Uh, also, they're going to have uh, a Halloween event. So there's going to be like kind of like new characters, the costumes, and things yes. of that nature. Uh, so you guys <laughs> can check that out. Um, they will have 4K uh, pre-downloads for Xbox OX. So you guys will be able to check that out. Um, now, for season pass holders, uh, October 23rd, you'll get the update. And on October 30th, everybody else will get the update. So uh, any thoughts, Jesse, about this? Um. Uh, yeah, I'm... You know, I'm just kind of starting to get into to Gears 4 and get, you know, get back into Gears again. So, you know, this will be nice. So, uh, definitely looking forward to uh, trying some of the new maps and things like that. I don't I don't have a season pass yet, but I probably will end up getting one here pretty quick. So, because I do, I do want to, I, I didn't say it in what we've been playing, but I have been play, playing Gears a little bit lately, so. So I definitely, yeah, will be looking forward to that. And it's been so long since, like you, you were mentioning Corey the, that map, and I, it's been so long since I played one. I, I'm sure I'll remember it when I see yeah, it. Yeah, as soon as you load but, up, you'll you'll recognize it as soon as you get into it. Yeah, because one, I played one a lot. I really liked one. Two was all right, and then after that, I just kind of dropped off. I didn't really pay too much to gear, uh, you know, pay too much attention to it. But uh, four definitely, they they made a lot of changes, you know, from the last ones I played, and I really like it a lot. So, yeah, I man, gears is good. I always forget how good it is, and then I play it, and it's like, oh yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, <why." laughs> yeah, it, it's fun actually just running back through it like i i think it's hard for me going to do the original gears of gears of war series but like every time i play four i'll just have a blast enjoying it i don't know man you know? Gear, the ultimate edition of gears one that came out was really good yeah it was good i mean it still but, felt clunky and heavy like gears one and two did but like mm-hmm. i mean it's literally just a reskinned version of one but it still was like Oh yeah, I remember why Gears of War was like such an important franchise like for gaming, you know? It's just like they kind of perfected that third person shooting mechanic that Resident Evil 4 started with, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it was just so unique at its time when it first came out. It like just like having the whole, you know, the the chainsaw and the bl- the blade on the gun and all that. Yeah. It was mm-hmm. such a big deal, you know. It was oh it was such a unique uh thing you know to have and to have the whole melee killing stuff and I remember it, that first time you just took that chainsaw and chainsawed <laughs> one of the enemies oh, so yes. yeah <laughs> oh man and then like when gears of war 2 the first commercial was like that blood red with just marcus and one of the locust guys having the chainsaw duel but it was just oh, like yeah. the blood red with the black outline 
and like they're having that chainsaw duel and then marcus <laughs> kicked him and turned him around and showed them the reverse chainsaw up the back and split him in half oh my <laughs> gosh that was amazing yes oh my gosh gears yes. gears marketing is so good like the the uh mad world commercial for gears one and then that chainsaw commercial for gears two uh and then like the the swarm kind of party for gears three like around the the raven helicopter where they were all it looked like they were like all trapped and stuff oh gosh gears marketing is so good <laughs> yes 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 well we're gonna move on from that uh it seems that Nisa's president says Microsoft is not very supportive of Japanese games. Uh, the president of Nippon Ichi America, Takuro Yamashita, told MCV that he does not believe Microsoft is very supportive of Japanese games in a candid interview with the outlet. The actual reason gets a little bit of uh, men- uh, uh, a little bit of menu. Uh, Munate, I think that is M I N U T I A E. I'm sorry, everybody. I'll be a better host next time. As Yamashita's reasoning has more to do with Microsoft requirements for publishing on the Xbox, he explains that Microsoft requires a minimum order for publishing on their systems. For niche games like the kind Nippon Ichi specializes in, the minimum is way above what they expect to sell. Niha Falcon president Toshiro Kondo also agreed, but explained that the Xbox's mind share or lack thereof in Japan is the largest determining factor for their decision not to support the system. Uh, and Jesse, you also mentioned this uh, about uh, Phil Spencer um, tweeting about going to Japan to meet with partners. Um, so uh, how do you feel about this? Yeah, well, like from the article that I, you know, that I read where they they kind of feel like it seems like maybe it's partially, you know, it is partially Microsoft's fault. But at the same time, it sounds like a lot of these businesses or these companies that are making games in Japan, Mm -hmm. they just they just kind of aren't looking at the Xbox because of like its lack of sales uh with the xbox one in in japan and stuff there it's just not as demanding of a system there so you know with them you know obviously being based there it would be really easy for them to overlook it and not really you know not really pay much attention to it but it seems like it's kind of uh you know like an it was an issue at least on both sides and you know with 360 they were selling really well there so 360 had a lot of stuff of theirs so it does kind of seem like that is the case that it, it it's not so much what microsoft's doing it's just how well they're doing there so i you know i but like this this uh article is talked you know about Phil and and uh, I forget who else it was. Aaron Greenberg. Uh, they both had gone to Japan and uh, like actually talked to some of the the you know the companies and places and are trying to trying to change this and and hopefully get some more Japanese based games on the Xbox and there's a you know they have a couple of them that that we've seen this the this e3 that will be on the xbox that may not have been if they hadn't gone over there and talked with some people so so i i think i think we're it's just another one of those things that, you know xbox is kind of in the situation right now where we got to just give them time and you know and once they get everything set up and you know start getting some pumping some more games out in general Mm -hmm. you know i think we'll probably see more and more stuff over time but it it seems like microsoft's trying trying to do what they can to to change this so i guess that's you know if if we know that much at least that's a good sign so yeah 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 i kind of i kind of feel like you know microsoft kind of just kind of didn't do like it wasn't doing well for the original xbox and it did a little bit better for the 360 with blue dragon and 
uh, Lost Odyssey, and you know they kind of really tried with the 360, mm-hmm. but then the Xbox One just didn't take off over there at all, just because a you know Japan as a whole is kind of moving away from the console gaming market and more handheld and mobile. That's why, you know, that's why PSP still sells over there, right? Is like, you know, they, they want to take their games with them. That's why mobile phone gaming is really big over there. That's why Switch is doing gangbusters over there. You know, people want to take their games with them. And, you know, that's why Sony, even Sony, even though they're a Japanese company, started marketing towards North America and Europe because... You know, they see the console market shrinking over there, but it's expanding here, uh, which is why their focus is here. And I think Microsoft, even though they go over there and they've sold some consoles over there, you know, and and they're trying their hardest to get an audience over there. Yes. I do think that overall they are doubling down on North America and Europe and saying, okay, here's the audience we know we're successful with. Let's kind of double down and and kind of give you know they're kind of leaning into the uh aspect that most people think of xbox like shooting things you know grand theft auto halo call of duty that kind of crowd and not really giving us the japanese side of things the way that playstation does or nintendo does you know like Mm -hmm. we're not getting all the final fantasy hd remakes for xbox you know we're not getting Dragon Quest. We're not getting, uh, you know, uh, some of these other Japanese RPGs and stuff. You know, we're we we got we're getting the Capcom games. You know, we're getting Resident Evil, which is great. But again, Resident Evil's kind of actiony focused still. Even though Seven was pretty horrifying, it still caters to a Western audience. It takes place in Louisiana, right? So, you know, we're getting different variety of Japanese published games, but there's still Japanese published games that's aimed for our market. Uh, you know, the only kind of JRPG that I can really think of that Xbox One really has that's not an indie project is Final Fantasy XV, right? And that's still an action RPG now, you know? So, yeah. I mean, they they want that Japanese audience, but at the same time, you know, even Sony isn't gaining ground over there, so maybe they're just kind of shifting their focus more towards, you know, the general audience from Europe and North America. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I know uh, NIS Nippon uh, Ichi. They've been big on uh, PlayStation, um, and definitely with this guy Five being a hit actually on Switch. I love um, I'm surprised. Yeah, I'm surprised that they didn't bring it out to Xbox. And uh, their market, even if they didn't bring it to Xbox here in America, they should have did it in Japan. But like they said, the rate of the system is so low, they would just be losing out on money. Yeah. 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 I wonder what would happen if they just did it digitally with that with that still save of money or anything. Mm. No, I don't think so. I, okay. I don't know. I I don't know that that line for digital sales and physical sales is so weird right now because I think us kind of like on the East Coast, like on the far e- like the real East Coast, not like my East Coast. So I live in Ohio, but like you know, like the real East Coast or the West Coast where living spaces are small and compact you see more digital sales but you know we kind of live in you know houses or bigger spaces and we like to display our physical collections Mm -hmm. so i think you know region kind of varies but like i don't know maybe i really don't know the situation of of like we don't live in japan i don't know if if the japanese like to display their gaming collections you know like do they have Vita cartridges over there that just kind of like sit in a giant pile and line their walls. Like I don't know, <laughs> you know, for such a yeah. small place, they they have almost as many people as we do in in the U.S. on like one twentieth of the landmass. So yeah. they're yeah. all kind of living on top of each other over there. Yeah. So I don't know. 
Yeah. yeah, one one of the games uh, I forgot. Uh, there's I don't know if you guys have really know anything about it. The Sword Art Online uh, series. Uh, have you ever heard of it? I heard of it. Okay. Uh, but I just haven't seen it. I think there is. Isn't it mostly on PS2 though? Uh, there's I'm... one for PS4. That's okay. Com- it's either out or coming out. Okay. I do know yeah. that they have that MMO RPG that's very Japanese coming out early next year. The what's it called? They they showed it at E3. Do you remember what I'm talking about? Yeah, I do. I forget what it's called. It's good. I'm just gonna look it up. There's a box yeah, right in front of me that tells me information. <laughs> yeah, the 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 uh, Sword Art Online Fatal Bullet. It's called. That's the one that's gonna come out for Xbox. Yeah. And that's going to be the first time that, that that franchise has ever come to Xbox. So so that that was one of the the uh, games that is coming to the Xbox One, you know, thanks to uh, to the Aaron Greenberg and, and uh, Phil Spencer kind of going going around and talking with people in Japan. So, yeah. yeah. Black Desert well, Online is what this game's called. Okay. Okay. I really, I really hope that uh, Phil Spencer brings some news and that they do get some support in Japan because I think Japanese players should get some uh, good Xbox games. Mm-hmm. I think they should. So, yeah. oh, oh, would you go say anything else, Corey? Or uh, no, I was just gonna mention like even though this is like a PlayStation Central theme, like they are Jap- Japan is starting to get a kind of a kind of like a niche first person shooter community over there and like we saw this with destiny where maybe the western type part of the game isn't appealing to them but the japanese trailer Mm -hmm. was all about the emotes and the dancing and like (laughs) that was really something that they pushed for playstation so like maybe if they find a way to really like like get that audience hooked you know like i don't know maybe do something in halo where you could have an emote or something or you know reference some japanese material or you know maybe <laughs> reference like the community in the game or something like do you know, it, do something creative to capture that audience they could do like they do on the dead rising games <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> make you like be able to wear like a Lego hat on your right. <laughs> and, like <laughs> Mega Man outfit. Right, <laughs> right. Well, it's 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 funny that you mentioned emotes, Corey, uh, because Budgie is delaying the Trials of the Nine multiplayer mode for two weeks. Um, I know some say that it's been canceled until for the two weeks but it's not uh destiny two players will have to get the next two weeks without the trials of the nine months player mode according to a blog post from budgie's community manager chris shannon budgie is working to fix a glitch that lets players use a emote to hide outside the map the mode in question is the mighty python inspired bureaucratic walk and according to reports by Eurogamer, the emote was pulled from sale earlier this week however that doesn't solve the issue of all the players who already bought the emote as a result trials of the nine will be offline for two weeks while bungie works to resolve the issue the event will resume on november 3rd uh corey would you like to speak to this uh no because well okay i just i'm not a huge trials player Mm. but all the people that I play Destiny with are really big in the competitive modes, and they've been pretty disappointed with Trials already. And, like, I think PvP in general has been pretty disappointing for Destiny 2. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I'm enjoying it, but there's a lot of hardcore players out there that are really disappointed, especially when Iron Banner rolled around and they mm-hmm. said that, you know, your light level doesn't matter, or Trials, your light level doesn't matter. You know, they took away... Uh, elimination for trials and made it countdown and survival i think which you know elimination was three on three and everybody got one life and that was it right everybody had one life and you had to take out the other team and yes you could revive your teammates but you couldn't revive yourself which was the big draw of that game uh that game type and now trials is literally just the same game modes you're playing in regular crucible but 
you know, there's a card and like a new social space attached to it. Uh, so I, th I don't think that this is a big deal because people are disappointed in trials anyway. Uh, you know, I, I've talked to my friends that play, play destiny hardcore and they're like, well, when call of duty comes out, we're not going to be playing competitive, uh, destiny anymore. Cause there's nothing, there's no progression attached to it. There's no reward really attached to it. I mean, there's a yeah. couple, there's a couple really good weapons from crucible, you know, better devils is the hand cannon that everybody loves. Uh, there's a couple trials guns. I think the assault rifle from trials is really good. And when they buff pulse rifles, that pulse rifle is going to be really good. But like, mm -hmm. there's no real reward for playing trials anymore. Like if you went flawless in destiny one, like you got special weapon, like there were weapons and armor attached to going flawless in destiny one. There was a, a carrot at the end of the stick that everybody wanted, you know, they, like it, it was just something special to say. Look, I got this cool gear from Trials. Like, okay, you got the Anubis helmet from Tri because you participated in Trials. Well, what if we gave you the gold version of that helmet if you went flawless? What if we gave you Ooh. the what if we gave you the adept version of the Trials assault rifle, which gives you better stats, better handling, better like faster rate of fire. Uh, you know, all these other things. Like, it's the same weapon, but it has better perks and better stats. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's none of that in Destiny 2. And that's what's really disappointing. That coupled with the token system that they add in Destiny 2, and the fact that you can't just buy the stuff that you want and infuse stuff into it, it's all random. Like, those are big complaints, and they're understandable complaints. I, I, like... When Iron Banner came around, all I wanted to do was buy the boots, but I had to keep playing until I got the boots for my Warlock. And I didn't play Trials with any of my other characters because I wanted to make sure, or Iron Banner with any of my other characters because I wanted to make sure I got the boots with my Warlock. I would do the, challenge, the daily challenges with my other characters and turn mm -hmm. the tokens in with my Warlock to try to get the boots. When I couldn't just get the boots i couldn't just buy them or they wouldn't drop in destiny one when you played iron banner that's like the gear that you get with tokens in destiny two like yeah once you leveled up your rep and whatever you got it you got a chance of getting this gear but the gear also dropped during the games instead of like the random blues that you get now or mm -hmm. you could just purchase them from a vendor for a certain amount of legendary marks or whatever now it's all random and it's the same thing with trials where you can't just buy the stuff you can't just go to the vendor and say hey look i want this like you can go to the lighthouse after one win instead of going flawless like they changed all this stuff to like broaden the appeal of destiny which i mm -hmm. think has brought a lot of people into destiny but it's also pushing a lot of the people who had hardcore hopes of pvp out of destiny and so Bungie is, is, says they're addressing a lot of these issues, and I think you know, I think Trials is not the only thing they're going to fix while Trials is away. I think there's, and during TwitchCon last week, they announced a bunch of big changes coming at the end of, at the end of November with Season 2, which includes the Dawning, which is cool new PvE content, uh, new gear and stuff, and I think they're going to add vendors. I think they're going to add the ability to buy stuff. I think they're going to fix trials. I think they're going to bring back elimination uh, for trials, which is going to be a big thing. So I just, I think they're going to fix a lot of things in trials, even though like trials is the main thing they're fixing. I think they're going to mm -hmm. fix a lot of the other issues that players have and trials is just like the focal point. So, yeah, I've, yeah. I've watched a couple of videos on it, you know, just like people talking about, because like i said I, before i've i played destiny one a little bit but only that but not much so i don't really know a lot about the original destiny but so i kind of just been watching some videos of people talking about you know like what what was in destiny one versus this and yeah and it seems to be the same thing as people are just kind of upset that 
there's no there's no reason or drive to really do raids or any of that stuff for only so long because once you get the one thing that you can get from it that's basically it i mean there's there's no reason to do it after that yeah that's another once you thing, get it that's another thing too you brought up a good point jesse like the prestige raid for destiny 2 mm -hmm. there's there's literally no reason to do it except to get the aura from the raid which doesn't really do anything it's just this this colorful halo that floats above your head right and like that's cool but it's literally the same gear there's no increase in light level like in destiny one when the hard mode raid came out you had to like a you you needed to complete the the normal raid and mm -hmm. the gear you got from the normal raid actually helped you prepare like it, it gave you stats to help you in the hard mode raid right and yes like say so like in the taken king the the normal raid the king's fall raid was light level 280 well the hard mode raid was 305 but you could increase your light level to 315 well the heart, the prestige raid in Destiny 2 is still the same light level. They're just adding little elements to the raid that, like, okay, instead of six uh, warhounds in the uh, gardens section, mm -hmm. there's eight. So you all you have to kill eight dogs, right? Or in the pools, instead of working in the triangle kind of fashion, like if it if you watch the pools like the the strategy for the normal raid is like okay you're in teams of three and you work in a triangle pattern well okay so you can't work in a triangle pattern anymore but it like the screen literally tells you what section of the map you need to go to so that's not really a challenge it's actually helping you of telling you where to go you know or like the the gauntlet instead of having two runners run the gauntlet the whole time you know, everybody kind of has to switch off every round in the gauntlet. So, mm -hmm. like, it's it's just teaching people how to do separate parts of the raid better. Like, it's not really a challenge. You know, it's, it's not really harder. Uh, it's not really adding anything to where, like, in Destiny 1, the raids, well, at least the last two, before they added, before they brought Vault of Glass and Crota back, like, and at a higher light level at the end of, of destiny one, like uh wrath in the machine and King's fall both had normal mode and then hard mode, which you had to be a higher light level and then challenge mode, which was an increased light level. Plus you had to beat the bosses in a certain specific way. And you had to complete like all these little things with before you even fought the boss while you're fighting the boss. It was like, all these cool little things and all these cool challenges and stuff that just like these just the little things that aren't in destiny 2 which is which is fine because like we're only two months in or like a month in right now month and a half i guess but like these are all things that they should have pulled from destiny 1 and learned and kind of you know moved forward yeah i get it we don't have you know, we have seven strikes right now and not mm -hmm. not 22 like at the end of Destiny 1. That's fine. It's a sequel when we're a month and a half in. It took three years to get that stuff. But yeah. like the little things like the competitive multiplayer stuff that you pulled from Destiny 1. Why change it to, to 4v4? Why not keep the 6v6 or the 3v3 modes? Like it was so easy to break up a raid. Like when we would raid in Destiny 1, that's six people. We would move into PvP. We would play control, which we could take our whole fire team in. It'd be 6v6. Or, you know, half of us would go play trials. The other half would go do strikes or whatever. And it's still yeah. split even, three and three. Now, when we're done with the raid, four people go and do competitive multiplayer, and there's two people stuck playing together with randoms, right? It's not an even, even split. And, and there's just all these little changes that they made that people aren't understanding. And I kind of wish, like, they would just come out and tell you, like, why did we make these changes? And, like, yeah. I mean, they kind of did. Like, 
4v4. They said it's easier to balance weapons and game types around 4v4 instead of splitting it between 6v6 and 3v3. But, like, it still doesn't... I, I Nobody really understands how that's easier because, you know, even in 6v6, like, you still have the... It's, it's still, like... I don't know. It was, they just made all these little changes and like the raid specifically too. Jesse, thanks for bringing that up again. Like that's the one <laughs> thing that we're all kind of boggled by was like, there's no hard raid. There's no raid that like, okay, the max light right now is three Oh five, but adding the hard raid, you can, you could potentially increase your light level by fifth, 10 or 15 more points, which would be great, but there's not even that. And so I don't know. And they say they're not bringing back Prison of Elders, which is one of my favorite game types. is basically is basically mm-hmm. a round based horde mode, where oh like, nice, where like oh that would have been awesome. Where you start in this middle chamber, and then one of the doors, in, there's four doors in this chamber, and you go when a door opens, you run through the door, and you you have three rounds per room, and then once you get through three or four rounds through the rooms, you fight a boss at the end, which is really cool. And then you got cool gear. Like one of the, uh, assault rifles from prison of elders was like one of the best weapons in the entire game. And like it, you had to beat the, uh, I don't remember challenge of the elders, which was the three round boss boss rush mode in there to get it. And it was awesome. It was really cool. It was a really cool thing that they added. And like it was a cool piece of PVE content for me because I don't really I don't I'm not good at competitive games so I kind of stay away from competitive unless I'm really playing with friends and so Prison of Elders was a cool way for me to keep playing and get cool gear you know and like they're not bringing that back uh, it's it they've just made all these weird decisions and I hope they change their mind and they said they're gonna announce some stuff and the changes that are coming. And it's probably not going to be with this update because I know PvP is their focus right now, especially trials. But I hope they change some stuff because, you know, it, I just I'm at a point where, like, you know, I've, I'm kind of done with Destiny for now. And it kind of sucks because I like the game a lot and I want to keep going, but I have all the best gear and there's no reason for me to do the harder stuff when I'm not getting the progression yeah so you know and and jesse i know you said you're kind of in the same place where like you know you've kind of progressed as far as you can go until you know we get a raid group together and try the raid and and get through that kind of stuff so yeah like my my major problem issue right now is i for the life of me cannot get any kind of assault rifle or you know uh uh, for whatever reason it just keeps on dropping the same same weapons like for my for my main kinetic weapon all i all i've been getting are uh scout rifles and that's it yeah i'm oh, i, yeah. I want i want a good i want a good assault rifle i want a a good you know something that i can use you know i i have decent second i have to use basically i can only use my secondary my secondary gun because that's the only uh thing that i'm getting options in yeah. but you know so it's just kind of yeah it's just kind of annoying me because it keeps on dropping like uh pistols or just stuff that i have no use for right now yeah, yeah. so yeah. it's and it's like okay well then they're also having issues with like guns being the same guns with a different name like there's there's a game there's a gun called Uriel's Gift, which is uh energy assault rifle. It's the assault rifle to have in the game right now. But during the faction rally, there is another weapon that looked just like this weapon, had the same exact stats, called the numbers, and it was the future war call assault rifle. But it was it was literally the same gun. Looked the same, same perks, same stats, and it, it just had a it just had a purple, red, and white skin on it because it was a future Cold War call weapon. And it's like, okay, well, that's weird. And then like, wow. they, people are having the same issue now too with like 
uh, origin story is the uh, the assault rifle that you get during the campaign. You can either pick that. Uh, there's a pulse rifle that you can get, or Nameless Midnight, which is the scout rifle. Uh, and the Iron Banner assault rifle uh -huh. is the same weapon, the same stats. It looks the same, but instead of the Vanguard, the giant V Vanguard logo on it, it has the Iron Banner logo on it. But it's the same gun. Yeah. That's stupid. So, like, there's a lot of people are starting to notice that too. And there's a couple shotguns that are similar and a couple sniper rifles that are similar. They're just. I don't know. There's there's just some weird things going on with this game, and I think it's because, like, it's the same issue that Mass Effect Andromeda had earlier this year was like they're on a but they're on a time crunch. They needed to get a product out, and some of the aspects of the game seem unfinished. And and well, like, and as well, well hopefully it gets a siege a siege. Uh the siege treatment and over time it just morphs into something that's actually oh, it much will. better. I, I mean, I think by this time next year, I think we'll be talking about this the same way we were talking about destiny one where like, yeah. you know, okay, this seems kind of bare bones and there's like the story's better, but like another issue right now too, is like, there's literally no reasons to do strikes or adventures or seek out those secret chests because you can just yeah. do public events and heroic public events, which take a quarter of the time and give you better gear. Yeah. Right now, right? People well, and I'm legendaries and exotics out of out of public events. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I I like literally I I've gone and done you know the searching for those those hidden chests and half the time I open them and there's nothing in them anyways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, mm -hmm. like the treasure that's maps. it's like yeah, the treasure map things. It's so stupid. What's the point in even wasting your money on all that stuff? You know, in game money if you don't even get anything for it. Yeah, yeah. I I definitely just moved on from the game. I finished the boss and just like there's nothing making me want to come back. It's you know, I mean, like so. it's it's. <sighs> It's just in this weird spot where, like, it's waiting for updates. It's waiting on player feedback. It's kind of like we put this game out, and we want your feedback so we can improve the game three months from now, six months from now, a year from now. It was the same as Destiny 1. I mean, it's a better product than vanilla Destiny 1, but at the same time, there's a lot of things that, you know, like, I, I don't even, like, I would know the names of the strikes in Destiny 1. I don't know the names of the strikes in Destiny 2. And, like, sometimes I get confused on which strike I'm doing because some of them are on the same planets, and it's like I'm halfway through a strike before I realize, oh, this is a different strike than what I thought I was doing earlier. Because, like, I mean, unless you're running a, unless you're running a Nightfall, like, there's no reason to run strikes. <laughs> you know? There's literally yeah. no reason to run strike yeah. when you can do yeah. public events. Which I get. Like, they fixed public events because they were worthless in Destiny 1. But now... They've made all the other content that was really fun to do in Destiny One worthless because public events do the same thing for you in less time. <laughs> so, well, we're gonna move on to our last story. Yeah, probably, <laughs> probably smart idea because I have yeah. so much uh, more to say that maybe we'll just save it. <laughs> we'll just save it. Um, the original Xbox backwards compatibility list has been leaked. Uh, some of the games that they show on here. Um, it's like round 12 games, uh, the Crimson Skies, uh, Star Wars, Dice of the Old Republic, Woo! Ninja Guy in Black. <laughs> Give me some Jade Empire and we'll be good to go. Uh, Sid Meier's Pirates, uh, Blood Ray, Future Frenzy, and some more games. So, Jesse, I know you mentioned that you and your friend are into Future Frenzy. Um, yeah, we, we used to play that all the time. <laughs> um, Good variety. Good, they made some good choices, but all of it is weird. Like, okay, Ninja Gaiden Black, Psychonauts, uh, and Prince of Persia would definitely be ones for me. Um, Dead to Rights and Red Faction 2? Uh, Dead to Rights was awesome. <clears throat> well, and I think. And Grabbed think... by the Ghoulies? I think I think some like some of those are kind of connected to like 
like game it seems like some of them i think are you know there's the newer games or newer versions of them uh-huh. or things related to it have been you know released either during the free play or or the or the uh, you know free the free things for the month or like they didn't they uh cuz did you say it was red red uh faction yeah red, red. faction 2 yeah, because didn't they release one of like some of the Red Faction games for like the free with with uh, Xbox Live or whatever? So like those kind of games make sense because a lot of those have been free, the newer ones mm-hmm. or whatever, or been you know disc. So I think it's it just seemed like that list. That it's kind of like some of them are just ones that have like the newer ones have been released you know, for free or whatever, or they're, you know, part of things. Because aren't some of them from Rare? Isn't one of them from Rare? Rare by the Ghoulies is. Yeah. So, like, the Rare replay, and, like, you've got, I don't know, it just seems like it it could be plausible just because it kind of fits with a lot of those kind of things, but... Yeah, I guess we'll I guess we'll find out. <laughs> it's hard to say with stuff like this because you never you never know. Yes, Corey, any thoughts on this before we get into our Arsenal exchange? I mean, I didn't really play a lot of the original Xbox. I played, I played Halo One, Halo Two, the Fusion Frenzy demo that was on the Halo One disc, <laughs> Knights of the Old Republic One and Two, and Jade Empire and Fable, and those were kind of like. I was really into my GameCube at the point. At that point, I uh-huh. was really into the JRPGs on PS2 at that point. So like, Xbox was more of a, you know, that's where I got my friends together, and we would have Halo One LAN parties, or you know, when I moved to Columbus and went to school down there, uh, you know, we would have the Xboxes hooked up in the door in our dorm room. And like people would just be in and out playing the land parties of Halo Two, or or you know. But at that point, like Smash Brothers was out, we were also playing Smash Brothers. So like, I don't know. My Xbox got a lot of love for certain games, but didn't really have a huge library because of GameCube and PS Two. So yeah. like, as long as like Knights of the Republic comes and you know the Fable, like f- all the Fable games are already backwards compatible the 360 versions of them so like i don't really need fable but like if knights of the republic jade empire maybe fusion frenzy are all backwards compatible eh, i'm good i'm good okay you know i okay. I, i'd I, like to see like the odd world games and stuff oh like that. Yeah, strangers wow. wrath strangers wrath is amazing yeah, I I played the Odd World games on Xbox. The, those are some of the ones that I remember playing. Oh my god, playing a lot of Wrath is like the best Sh- game ever. It was kind of odd to me because <laughs> it felt broken. Stranger Stranger's Wrath. I don't know. I'm like, I, it just wasn't a good FPS. To don't me. make me fight it's... you. Don't make me fight you. <laughs> Stranger's Wrath is the best Odd World game. You can fight me when I come back next year. I am. I'm gonna fight you. I'm gonna leave you somewhere. Yeah, because I think like we. I think I even one time. I think me and my friend might have hooked our Xboxes up, and like he had it on one TV, I had it on the other, and I think we played like Command and Conquer and and stuff like that. You know, a lot of those uh, games that were popular on PC too. You know, like people mm-hmm. usually played multiplayer on PC that that you could play on the xbox and stuff too that was that was one of the like because literally when xbox came out i i basically uh ps2 and uh, my ps2 and my gamecube uh, dropped off the face of the planet wow <laughs> i i completely i mean i still played them obviously but but my xbox became my uh my number one system and i basically from that day forward would buy everything for that Instead of the other ones. So. Okay. Well, everybody, that was our Arsenal news. And we're going to get to our last section, our Arsenal exchange. Last week, (laughs) Jesse brought a topic. But this week, our boss man, Mr. Corey Derrick, is bringing a discussion. 
Yeah. Kari. And, and I wonder how many people have wondered why we haven't talked about this yet. Because it's probably the biggest news story probably for the rest of the year, to be honest with you. No, not yet. Y'all, yeah, it is. Dude. We got two more. Trust me. We got two more months before we get to the biggest uh, news story of the year. I EA has closed Visceral Games, which is devastating enough. But they've also... They didn't say this, but they kind of canceled the Amy Hennig Star Wars single player game that we were kind of looking forward to. And that is a blow to a lot of gamers because, you know, I'm not the biggest Star Wars fan, but I enjoy good stories in the Star Wars universe. I really like I know this wasn't a very good game, but I really enjoyed the story in The Force Unleashed like I thought it was a cool concept that Darth Vader had this hidden apprentice and that he was planning to overthrow the emperor and you know they kind of start like this character kind of helps start the rebellion uh you know and we saw a lot of like we saw young Leia in there you know this it was just a really cool concept of a story and the second game was it was okay like it wasn't the story wasn't great, but it kept me interested enough to hoping one day they would make a third game and they never did. Mm -hmm. Uh, But this game was like, again, everybody was kind of when Lucas, when Disney bought Lucasfilm and they canceled star Wars, 1313, Mm -hmm. a lot of people were hoping that this would make up for that too. Right. Where like it's using frostbite uh, we already saw what Frostbite could do to Star Wars assets in Battlefront, which looked like, say what you will about the gameplay, and if you like the game or not, you cannot deny that that game did not look phenomenal. Uh, and that all, it also stays true with Battlefront 2, you know? But cancel, like mo- shifting the perspective of this game, basically, uh, I wish I could find it. Uh they basically said that they want to turn this into a destiny like game, a game, a, a service based game where people keep coming back to it for years to come after it's released, probably meaning microtransactions and loot boxes and loot based games and multiplayer stuff. And it just really kind of hurt a little bit because I really want it. Like if If EA is struggling to create a single-player, story-based game set in the Star Wars universe, why would you let EA have Star Wars in the first place? Because they thought that it would be a big hit when they bought Battlefront. That's why when they showed in E3, when they first was talking about all the EA universe with the Star Wars games... That they didn't show no kind of gameplay or anything. Like, they didn't really show us anything. They just didn't show nothing. So now to hear out of the blue that this is happening, they're changing their business strategy, and they're placing all their bets on making their games, for uh, these games, pay to win or games for service. And it's that's bad business. Yeah. That is, like... Well, now it becomes the question because everybody's been making a joke. Okay, you know, don't let EA buy you because they're gonna end up closing you. Yeah, but it's kind of, memes I mean, it, it's kind of true. But it's just like, is EA like literally in trouble? Like, what I is going? I don't think EA is in trouble. I think just because like they're out to 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 please their shareholders and stuff, and like that's all fine and good because we want companies to make money so they can keep making us great games but at the same time you gotta weigh your options and like if you're dumping so much money like you you need to form a budget around your project and say okay so a game like battlefront 2 if we make loot boxes and we pour a bunch of money into this game and marketing stuff this is Mm -hmm. the x amount of dollars we're going to make back from this game right that's That's what they have to do the math on. On okay, so Battlefront Two currently is their game's 
this is their service game right now. You know, coming out soon. It's going to be a big hit based on the Star Wars license. They're adding loot boxes instead of a season pass to make money. Uh, you know, there's all these things, cosmetic and supposedly you can buy abilities and weapons now too through these loot boxes, which is a topic unto itself. I don't want to talk about it because I'm really tired of talking about that. But it's there. You know, that's how they're going to make their money. And they probably have all kinds of financial people on staff to say, okay, if we sell this loot box at X amount of money, mm -hmm. this is the amount, this is the, you know, projected maximum amount of money we can make on this game over 12 months, 18 months, 24 months, you know, until Battlefront 3 comes out. This game, like, say they put, like, five hundred million dollars into battlefront well make this single player game a hundred million dollar game instead of a five hundred million dollar game and then make four hundred million dollars on the game that's three hundred million dollars in profit you know hundred million dollars goes to the developing the game marketing you know the game will market itself it's freaking star wars right like mm -hmm. come on dude all you have to say is hey new star wars game lightsaber but you know what toys. i i i don't think star wars hold that much power anymore i think it's been oh, losing yeah, it does. It's, it's more popular than it's ever been it's i think it's been losing its its popularity is is uh is I don't want to say reverence or something. It's just something about it. It just seemed to go. I don't know if it's going to be when the movie comes out or anything, but like people caring for it, like with its products and even with the games and stuff. I don't think a lot of people are like quick to run to it. You know, Star Wars has become the safe birthday gift. If you look at it. Yeah, but as, as a, it, as it's a, as defaulting a to like a safe birthday gift that makes it more popular than ever because it's the safe thing to get, which makes it popular. But well, like, the, well, the thing the thing about it is is that it's safe because people don't know what else to get. Well, and, well it's the same as like and, the Marvel stuff right now, right? Yeah, like, I mean, well, yeah, there's, I mean, they've got it's, it's Star Wars is the sci-fi version of the Marvel stuff right now, where like they've got a movie coming out every year. They've got some sort of TV show coming on, t like TV every year now. You know, they've got a bunch of toys, and now, you know, they're trying to figure out what to do with games. Like, it's just, it's this, it's, it's in the machine now. It's, it's part of the Disney machine, just like Marvel movies. Well, what? The well, I was gonna, I, I think the thing is, though, is, like, Ed, you're, you're, like you're right that it uh, that there are some people that are starting to kind of get annoyed with like what they're doing and especially like what we're talking about right now you mm -hmm. know with them canceling that that story based mode i i think what's going to happen is it's going to basically it's going to go the way of what uh the call of duty franchise kind of is right now where it will still be really popular. It will always be really popular because it's Star Wars, but you're going to have a big enough chunk of people that are making enough stink about not liking the direction that it's going in or them not doing enough with the franchise that they will have to start. They'll get forced into maybe making some changes and doing something, you know, that, that would better, you know, better the franchise you know as far as gaming goes but uh, i'm it's just not at that at that point yet it's still kind of early you know for the for anyways for them to be making the star wars games and stuff like it's, where it is now it's just really crazy to think like ea made this deal in 2014 i know 2015 they made the deal in 2013 because that's when they announced Amy Hennig's game in Battlefront 1, which came out in 2015. And then in 2015 at E3, they announced the Respawn game, which is also a single-player action game. They, yeah. i probably assuming since they hired the God of War create like combat team, like I'm well, assuming it's going to be a lightsaber game. Like I'm assuming it's going to be a Jedi lightsaber game. Right. 
but with that said, it's how does EA have this license for four years and is just now getting around to their third published game? If you include the mobile game that they're doing, like this is all Battlefront 2 is only their third game, and if they're shifting production on this game that had a late 2019 release window, according to the sources at EA. Now they're shifting production to make it instead of a linear single player action game, they're making it like a kind of a more open world destiny like game with loot and multiplayer features and, you know, a campaign, but still have an end game similar to destiny. Like that pushes it to 2020 at the earliest 2021. And by that time, they're already eight years into their 10 year deal. Well, I I think it's the sales of their other games, of their sports games. There's the sale of their sports games, in my opinion, well, have yeah, brought what's, them. Uh, that's what the ha- sports games are. What's making them the money, like to have them do projects. Well, like th- th- I I think that's part. Of, that might be one of the problems. It's not making them enough money for them to fund for them to fund three companies or four companies or whatever for these Star Wars games. They going on their sales for those sports games need to be needed to be out the box more than what they expected, and I don't think they got enough money from that because if they're going to be pouring all this money into a Star Wars game, how, how do you how how a how did you create a story within this universe that's not connected to any books or any movies but yet still fits not even with the cartoons and stuff like what what are they going to create that's going to make it feel like an original Star Wars game and if they're going to do that they're going to have to spend a lot of money for it now i mean uh, last uh, year tra- last year alone between uh, their mobile game, which they have the number one m- money making mobile game out of a major publisher, mm-hmm. they have Star Wars Battlefront, which made them money. Like this in their 2016 revenue report, their operating cash flow. This isn't their net profits or you know whatever. Their operating cash flow. This is what they spent on games. Is 1.2 billion dollars is what they spent. It is what like the money they're operating with. You're telling me they can't take like 200 million of that, 300 million of that operating cash flow and just give it to a studio to make a single player game to make them like double or triple their money. Is that no, not enough because, money? That's not enough no, money for be- them. No, because the thing about it is if they took that much money, they're going to have to do Grand Theft Auto 5 numbers to recoup that back. Oh, oh EA is not... This is the thing with EA. EA is not really good delivering anything out of sports sports I, or I agree with action you. sports games. I think, and like, so, I think, you know, Mass Effect Andromeda is the pinnacle of EA's, uh, EA's inability to manage projects outside right. of the sports. Because sports is on a cycle. They know when they have to be out. Like they're on a nine month crunch every year, right? That's fine. That's, that's in the system. That's, that's their operating, but everything outside of that, you look at mirrors, edge catalyst mismanaged dragon age inquisition. If you remember, they needed it out by holiday so they could make the money back mismanaged good game. Not a great game, but a good game really mismanaged. Need for Speed is a franchise that's been highly mismanaged since 2013. Mass Effect Andromeda, super mismanaged. How do you change a project's engine 18 months before release? How do you do that? How do you make a game like Mass Effect in 18 months? Like, they're working, they're working on Mass Effect Andromeda, have all these grand ideas, have this game almost done, and just working out the original procedural elements of it in unreal engine and they switch it to frostbite just because they felt like it and they need it out in 18 months how do you do that why would you do that 
Well, because they don't want to pay the owner royalties or the licensing fee with Unreal Engine, so that's why they f they moved it to Frostbite. Right, but you now couldn't, you couldn't pay the licensing fee for like another twelve months because this game is almost done. And, and that's probably why I feel like their business. What's going on with their business? And maybe I mean, that's why they moved to back to Frostbite because. It feels like EA is having some big money problems that we don't know about because you close Visceral, who was working on a Star Wars game. Guess what? People have been people would have supported that game, and I think this game would have been would have would have sold more copies than Battlefront. I believe because uh, Amy Hen Hendrix or uh, Hennig, Amy Hennig, Hennig, Amy Hennig. She's a great writer, mm -hmm. so she was going to by the, by the pictures that they show at that E3 press conference, literally yeah, show that this show. game the five frames yes. a second slideshow. So and just that artwork was going to guarantee them sales, mm -hmm. but because of the transition of of how uh, games games for service is moving. EA probably believes that they will make more money that way than they will do with a, a story-based game because some of their story-based games have not sold well. AE Mass Effect, uh, Dragon Age Inquisition, like the like these story games. Uh, but if it's like a multiplayer online game, they that they could nickel or die with. They feel like they will make more money that well. They, way. I mean, they will make more money. That's I mean, that's just how it works. You give somebody mm -hmm. something, you give more things for people to buy. You're just like people are gonna buy it. Like maybe not everybody, but you know, if you get if you get thirty percent of the people that buy, let's say Battlefront Two comes out, you get thirty percent of those people to spend an extra twenty or thirty bucks, like mm -hmm. on loot boxes and stuff. You're you're gonna double your money. Like you're just you're just going to. You know, it's 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 not like that hard to to say, but like then you get the five percent that are the whales that spend a hundred, hundred and fifty, two hundred, you know, sometimes even closer to three hundred dollars on loot boxes. Like those are the people that are really gonna push them over the edge, and that's what they want. Like that's I listen to Game Informer talk about this. I listen to Giant yeah. Bomb and the Giant Beast Cast talk about this. Like you're getting into really dangerous territory and you're really playing with people's like, like if I was, if I was a developer on one of these teams and I knew somebody was spending three or $400, like, like if you, somebody would spend like $50 a paycheck on this game, like I would be kind of cringing a little bit because you're tre you're treading in like moral issues. You're treading on like, you're treading on predatory, uh, acts of like, Okay, maybe, it's maybe some it's people have addiction problems. Some people have gambling addiction problems. Some people have like money issues that they don't know how to manage their money. Like th these are like predatory things that these companies have teams specifically set up to figure out the best way to like not necessarily seek out these people, but like make it easy for these people to get into that mindset of, oh, maybe one more dollar, I'll get this skin. One more dollar, I'll get this weapon. You know, well, like, it's 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 EA is seeing it as a business. This product is only for us making money, which which fun, is fine because fun. like the higher ups, yeah, video games is a business. They, I'm sorry to tell people it's a business. They need to find a, a way business. to monetize. Yeah, but then it's it, it gets sad because it's going to make people feel like EA, you don't care about what makes a video game. You only using this as a transaction. Well, I mean, that's, and that's George, what EA and, is. They're, then that's where indies well, come in to say, like, okay, indies care about their product. We get to buy these games at a cheaper price. But at at this point, like, would you spend an extra $10 on a game? Would you spend sixty nine ninety nine to get everything that are in these loot boxes? Would you spend seventy nine ninety nine? Like, the good a good comparison I heard, not, not necessarily for, like, you know, loot boxes or anything, but when The Witcher mm -hmm. 3 came out, that game was so big and so expansive. Like people were like, "Yeah, if they charge seventy nine ninety nine for this game, it would be understandable because you're getting three hundred hours of content in this game." Yeah, 
uh, you know, their expansions alone could have been sold as separate games, and you would have gotten a full game's worth of content out of it for $60, and you got them for $25 apiece, you know? Whereas, you know, you see Star Wars Battlefront come out, there's barely any content in it. Like, you have something like eight multiplayer maps, like 40 modes that are all essentially the same mode with, di like, slightly different features in it you know and you have your spaceship mode and you have your hero mode for 60 bucks and then f they charge you another 50 dollars for a season pass for what a few maps and a few characters like that's uh, man i don't even this this is this we see this and this is get the fired thing up with... get all hot and sweaty and <laughs> This is the Ooh. thing. That, <laughs> if I had hair, I'd rip it out. <laughs> this is the thing with EA, and you know, I I, I talked to uh, everybody. Um, the podcast Extra Jump podcast. I was on there, and we was talking about microtransactions and stuff like that. And I completely feel that when you spend money on games like this. You need to keep the game for eternity. You don't need to sell it because if you're if you end up selling it, you just gave that company free money. Mm -hmm. And the reward that you got from it got from it, even though it's it's like intangible items, because you can't use it in real life, you just do free money to them. And now you're being gypped because you don't recoup all that money from the game that you're trading in. Yeah. Here I have a I have a question for you. Do you think that the closing of Visceral is going to affect the sales of Battlefront? No. No. Because guess what? I mean, if I'm not already, like because they did this cuz like it, I was going to buy it, Battlefront 2 because I wanted to support the Star Wars license because I wanted this game that they are no mm -hmm. longer making. Like, I have no reason to buy Battlefront 2 now. Like, it looks cool. Like, I'll probably I'll probably rent it at Redbox and play through the campaign and take it back. Like, that's well, that's probably what I'll do. But th this is the thing. Even when they close it, guess what? If you pay for the pre-order to put, do the demo, you a sucker. So them closing them closing the studio, they already got your money for the pre order unless you're gonna cancel it and get your five dollars back or whatever that you or whether you pay for it all or you did it digitally. Because yeah. if you did it digitally, they already got your money and yeah, you're, you're stuck with Because there's no so return policy. Right. So even with them closing the even with them closing the uh closing restaurant, they somehow got some money from yeah. the pre orders. Yeah. So and that's already guaranteed sales right there. I just, you know, I'm just, I'm like, I'm shocked that they did this and really disappointed that they did this to the point where like, I don't know how much I really want to support EA games now. And like, I know I'm one person and but FIFA sells millions of copies and Madden mm -hmm. sells millions of copies. And like, you know, I'm one person that, you know, maybe $60 doesn't matter to them, you know, but. <laughs> Well, I think this is this. Well, we're all jumping on EA, but let's jump on Visceral. Were you guys delivering a product that was satisfying to EA that they could market it, that they could showcase? Because now this is going. To, this this is a question that I have for you guys. If Visceral didn't have nothing for E3 or even for the PlayStation experience, do you think this closing would have been justified? I, I don't know. I just, I feel like games get so caught up in, like, in, we're in this weird space where if games get announced too early, we complain that they showed it too early. But if they get, sh like, it, we know about this game, but they haven't shown it, now is the game in trouble because we haven't seen it. And it's like, look, the Frostbite engine is clearly really hard to work in. And you know, DICE has it down because it's their engine, right? It's, it's right. their property. But we saw BioWare really struggle with it. We've we, Obviously, we've seen Visceral struggle with it because they got a canceled game out of it, you know? Building a world and assets, 
from scratch in this engine that's apparently really hard to build on like that sucks it takes a lot of time and you know them giving them a six-year time frame they had time to work on it well well this is a like we we, we talked about frostbite and like i said it makes buildings look good when they fall outside of that frostbite looks bland boring and it looks like they can't do nothing about uh, it doesn't make a game look any bit good the textures still look horrible because guess what we talked about halo 5s and whatever engine that they're running on that's what star wars should have been running on compared to what frostbite is running on i i think i think frostbite frostbite is built for environments and you know it looks really good when you're playing a first person shooter Mm -hmm. uh you know i think it makes really pretty environments i still don't know about you know character designs and stuff because it was built for a first person you know style game and now they're trying to update it and and, you know i don't know maybe the campaign for star wars battlefront 2 like the commercials and stuff make the game look great but that's their job that's their job to make a great looking commercial to sell the game in gameplay like i don't know how the game looks you know i'm assuming i've I've played it i played the demo a little and it was like similar to the the first one but it, it still was like a lot better as far as visuals yeah go and and uh some some of the guns felt a little bit better, like they actually did something. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, I, I, they and they kind of have added like power, like like a different kind of power style, like power up type thing with certain guns and and like they've done quite a bit and changed it. it I I didn't think it was that bad, but yeah, but I, I mean, mean, but then again, like. You see a team that's been working with Frostbite since, you know, bad co- Battlefield Bad Company. And then, you know, they've been working with this engine for so long that they know the ins and outs of the engine. They know, like, okay, this doesn't work right in- from this perspective. How do we change that? We get our internal engineers who've built this engine to fix it for us. Whereas, you know, you give them... Uh, not updated like you give this engine to bioware and are in there like I, i'm just trying to see like okay dice knows the engine from the inside out but you give it to an external team they still need to learn the engine and this is something ed that we talked about a long time ago mm-hmm. or i think before even arsenal x was a podcast yeah where, like get let some dice people go to bioware and teach these people teach the developers how to use a new engine like bioware's never used frostbite before give to have a team that goes out and teaches you know visceral or bioware or mont like ea montreal or vancouver how to use frostbite to give them a teaching team so they know the ins and outs the way that dice does that's why mass effect andromeda didn't look great that's why you know maybe battlefront or not Battlefront, but like, you know, maybe that's why we didn't see any of this 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 Star Wars game because maybe they didn't know how to make character assets in Frostbite. You know, ma- the environments looked great, but like we didn't see any gameplay or character movement or you know waving flags or cloth material. Like Dice knows how to do all that, and that's why Battlefront looks great. But you give it to this external teams. They don't know how to do it, and nobody's showing them how to do it, and that's why projects are falling behind schedule, and that's why EA shuts down Visceral. Be- well, because EA don't want to spend the money to educate. Well, then that's EA's fault. Like that's that's why nobody likes EAs because they don't want to spend the money to teach a team how to make a proper and, game and the engine that they're trying to force down everybody's neck. You know, and and, and you made people stop using Unreal so you could unify the companies to use Frostbite. So yeah. if you're if you're trying to unify everybody, they have to learn it. Yeah, 
And we 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 don't got no indie game that's on Frostbite. We go we don't got have a double A game. I don't care if it was a bad game. Nobody for outside the week, EA is using week. Frostbite. And like I know it's EA's proprietary engine, but like if you want Frostbite to be as big as Unreal, as big as Unity, as big as you know some of these other engines that people love to like, uh, the, not love to use, but like art, they allow people to make great games with ease, like. Yeah, like make it and teach people to use it and make it easy to use. Make it feature complete when you're pushing a big AAA tentpole title. Because like reports were coming out after Mass Effect Andromeda came out, like <laughs> that the engine that Frostbite engine they were using was not feature complete, was not the fully updated version, which is why. The audio wasn't syncing correctly, which is why some of the faces look bad. Like the the, the third person character aspect of the game was not feature complete. That part of the engine was not feature complete when they received the engine. The only team that had the feature complete version of that engine was Dice. Dice, because they're the and ones. That's that why made their the third engine. person stuff looked better in Battlefront than it did in Mass Effect. You know, and I realize like Mass Effect had big open spaces to move around in, but so did Battlefront. Like Battle Battlefront and Battlefield both have big open multiplayer arenas to move around in. And it's just ridiculous that you have this big AAA tentpole game that everybody loves Mass Effect. Like it's it is a powerhouse of a franchise that you have and like this is the game. This is the one chance you have to make good on how everybody felt about Mass Effect 3's ending. And you're just going to pardon my words here but like you're just gonna give them a shitty it uh version of the engine and you they're just gonna say oh we're just gonna shit this game out because we spent four years in development on it instead of five that's that's unacceptable for a triple a title and that's like the same thing we were talking about destiny earlier where like mm -hmm. destiny 2 feels incomplete like it has a great campaign that felt great. The raid feels great, but the game feels incomplete. And that is the trouble that EA is having with their games. Now mass effect was very incomplete, you know, and now they're struggling mm -hmm. to make single player experiences because they don't know how to manage things. They don't know how to teach people to use their engine and they don't know how to Be complete. It's, like, it's, it's, it's the Nintendo problem. You do not have people. <laughs> you don't. You do not have people in your in the business that can make Nint that that make Nintendo games that can help out and make the game that you want to market and sell. Yeah, we yeah. we have we have Miyamoto, we had uh, Takashi, we had Iwata, who was president of Nintendo. If that man was still alive, he could go and help the Star Fox team make the game that they want to get want to make and still be able to run the company. You don't have CEOs, no one in the C CEOs. It is for EA, it's just like make sure that it's on time, make sure you market it good, make sure you got the DLC ready and what we could penny that we could nickel and die, put it out and let us see if the money will roll in. And that's that's where like Xbox had like the closest thing anybody has to Iwata was and like the closest thing anybody had Xbox has Phil Spencer he gets mm -hmm. it right and like all these other companies like Sony has Shuhei Yoshida but he's been moved around so much lately and Adam Boyd's left and you know they uh all these people are moving around in Sony like they're kind of stumbling right now to find like the quote-unquote face of what like showing off their games and like i think xbox phil spencer i think is the best thing to ever happen to xbox and like, yes you know he's he's doing such a exactly xbox, <laughs> phil spencer gets the x throw it up Gosh, throw would, it up first i would love to just talk to that man someday you know <laughs> and like they have xbox has you know major nelson they have phil spencer they have like personalities that are also gamers and they understand the product they're trying to sell right ea yeah. does not have that at all they and do I... not have that and like some people want to blame disney for like cracking down on this stuff 
I'm sure Disney is probably the part of all this that's even more furious because EA just wasted four years of development on a game that's never coming out. Yeah. And, like, maybe it was good, maybe it was bad, maybe it was indifferent, but you're wasting Disney's money now. Like, this isn't just your money. This isn't a Battlefield spinoff that you canceled. This is a major franchise that's been around for 40 years at this point and is owned by one of the biggest companies in the world, and you're effing with their money now. Well, it, everybody's probably wondering why did Disney even go with EA? Oh, I, dude, I've been wondering that since day one, man. <laughs> I'm like, I get it. Like, Disney Interactive doesn't, they don't mm-hmm. want to, they want to license their stuff out because it's cheaper for them. And I think, you know, the Avengers project with Square Enix it was a smart move with Crystal Crystal D and uh, Idos Montreal. Like, I think, I think that's a good pairing because Tomb Raider's great, Deus Ex yes. is great. Like, that is a good pairing. I would have loved them to give single-player Star Wars stuff to them. Yeah. Please. Just, like, it just baffles my mind that, you know, even even Activision Blizzard would have been a better choice over EA. You know, Activision knows shooters, could have done Battle, could have done Battlefront, you know. Mm-hmm whatever it might not have looked as great but it would have played well would have been fun you know they they know uh how to market their games you know they know what audience they're going for they probably would have crapped out a couple single player stuff similar to the spider-man crap and transformers crap that they put out but like they still would have been serviceable games that people like generic joe schmo would have walked into the store oh i think fighting uh, droids with lightsabers would be fun. Like, they could have got that point across enough, you know. I, I, it's just well, man. I, I think I think one of the reasons, uh, and I'm probably answering my own question, is that Disney got out of the video game business after the Star Wars uh, Infinity. So instead of them making RIP. the game, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> instead of them making the game. Let's get with a company, a third-party company who's who knows Activ- their Activision knows knows toys to life. Skylanders, man, <laughs> could have continued Disney Infinity with Activision, man. Could have just <laughs> given me the X Men characters I wanted, given me the Rogue One characters, given me a Deadpool guy, given me some you know classic Disney characters. Still don't like. My Donald, Mickey, and Minnie up there are really sad because they don't have Daisy, Pluto, or Goofy, okay? Never got my Winnie the Pooh characters. Never got... Dude, never got my uh, Hercules or Mulan or... Oh, I guess I do have Mulan. But, like, you know what I mean? Like, eh, just sad, man. I'm really sad. Didn't get my Moana characters. Man, now now if I want custom Disney Infinity characters, I gotta go to that guy online that charges twenty bucks a character. Good Jeez, luck. <laughs> Good luck. No. But like you know, but you see what I mean? Like we kind of crap on Activision because they are out to make money, but at least they're upfront about it, and at least they know how to market their product, and at least right. they have a diversified portfolio. And even if you don't want Activision to make the single player games, you have Blizzard, which makes a great game in Overwatch, makes a great I, I, loot based game. What if they made Star Wars Diablo, man? How, can, can how I, many people can would I buy tell Star Wars one, Diablo? That would be one, awesome. One thing I will say at the Activision that they deliver on their products. If yeah. there is a del- if there is a delay, that means they just need more time to finesse it. But you will get a product yeah. from Activision. Yeah. You don't get you you, you don't get no no joke or not nothing to show up for it. You're going to get a product. Mm-hmm. Yeah. EA, this is ridiculous. You are and you have been giving the Star War license. People hold this series up high, and you cannot be treating it like it's a cash cow. 
and people are people are seeing that you guys after you close visceral they're going to see that you're treating this the series as a cash cow and that's alone is going to damage that brand i mean they're seeing it as a cash cow but they've only put out one game or well two if you include well, the mobile game like they put out two games like say what you will about activision single player games they probably would have crapped out six games by now like you know they would have crapped out some some 10 level five out of ten jedi power battles stuff man i want a jedi power battle too man <laughs> oh wow amazing. well it just it just seems like ea, EA a lot of their stuff uh, like all their good uh single player games that they had like dead space and all that stuff like they just dropped it you know have nothing to do with it and just it seems like that that's what they're basically doing is just targeting and just going completely over to games w where they can make money like that with the, with the loot based games and and just not even it's like they're not even going to deal with with regular story based games at all anymore it, i mean i hope that's not the case but I mean, other than the sports games, that's guaranteed. They know they're going to make money from that, so they don't have to worry about it. It's like they're just taking the safe route, basically, of like what's going to make us the most money, and if it's not going to make us the most money, then what's the point in even worrying about it? Yeah, yeah. and like I hope they don't do that, but it's what it seems like they're trying to do now. Yeah, and, you know... Gary Witta was on a podcast earlier this week. It was talking about this. Uh, you know, he he's worked on Star Wars. He's writing Star Wars books. He wrote the treatment for Rogue One. Like he's involved in Star Wars, and he, like he was, he said that this is just a disgrace to the license, to the stories, to the world. That you know, Amy Hennig, one of the best writers, probably if you were to create a list of the best writers in video games right now she would probably be in the top five probably the top three writers behind maybe behind ken levine maybe you know i don't know if you would put neil Druckmann or bruce straley up there like but like you know what i mean like she's in the top tier of video game writers yeah and you know ea has disgraced a studio disgraced a bunch of workers by taking away their jobs now they did say they're relocating as many assets as they can, whatever that means. Uh, and, you know, they're working with Amy Hennig on her next move, which means she's probably out of there, going to go work on something else. But, like, you closed a stored studio that has a lot of great character and a lot of great games behind them. You know, Dead Space is a beloved franchise. Dante's Inferno not a great game but had really cool combat that you could have very easily seen in a star wars game you know they it's it's just like the more i talk about it like the less angry i get and the more mm. just like i don't want to say disgusted because that's a strong word but that's kind of how i feel you know like i feel disgusted that like they're not i don't know man just the, it's 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 mm. It's weird because it's not on the level of scale bounds cancellation and you know, well platinum still is open, they just moved on to something else. But it it feels bad for games this generation when you when you show something and promise that you promise and go all out that you're gonna have a big game that everybody know they're going to love and then to see this kind of stuff happen as the result mm -hmm. and it, it, it and to a lot of players it just feel like you guys gave up and you close the, and you close the studio and of course we're going to get the PR talk and probably people are under contract that they can't really say anything but if you were going to close them, do it the normal way. Let them release a game and dare close. Yeah. And, like, I, I know we're starting to talk in circles here, but, like, the last thing I want to say is, like, mm. it's not like EA is hurting for money. You know, I just I just said they are they have 
cash to work with you know that stats don't lie you know i they they could have spent the money to put this game out and had a product they could be proud of because sometimes like sometimes you need the, like even even though it's star wars and it would have sold well because it's a star wars game like you could have had that prestigious game that you know maybe doesn't sell 12 to 18 million units is similar to battlefield or battlefront but it sold four or five million units and getting you know accolades maybe potential game of the year type game that you could put in your trophy case and say look at this game we're proud because we make a game like this you know Mm -hmm. and that could have been their game that they spent the money on you know that they invested in and now they have awards and they could brag about the awards which would then generate more money because the sequel to this game would you know make them more money or like you know a future star wars project would make them more money because this game did so well critically you know it's just man it's just it's a letdown. Yeah, That's it's a is. it's a big letdown. You are you are one hundred percent correct, and I don't really have anything else to say about it except that it's just it's sad that we lost a great studio, and mm-hmm. a lot of great developers are now looking for jobs because Visceral was not a small studio. You know, oh, they, I think they'll land something because well, I'm, I'm sure a yeah. lot of them like. I know a lot of them are moving around, but I know Naughty Dog reached out to a lot of people. I know maybe maybe Donnie Dog will hire their combat team, and the next Naughty Dog game will have hey. great combat. Hey, Gearbox is hiring, so for a new FPS, we might get Borderlands Three. Yeah, I'm just, uh, yeah, even just, uh, even Volition, Volition was hiring. Yeah, so it, I just okay. I hope that you know this doesn't affect too many people, and that the people it does affect land on their feet somewhere at a better studio that's going to yeah like well, yeah not a better studio but like a better company that's going to treat them better than ea has just treated them you know yeah or or get to do it or like what's nice about the only you know one of the only positive things that usually comes from this is when when they do this kind of stuff is you end up uh getting a new completely new game that no one really thought of that was kind of like some kind of passion project that someone had kind of stored away for you know a rainy day or you know like so that's that's what i'm hoping is maybe this will end up being a you know turned into a positive over time you know i because that's the thing is it's like anytime you can pick up new you know new ideas and and new people and work with different people, you end up getting some pretty cool things. So, mm-hmm. you know, ho- hopefully this will, this will have a, you know, and it's negative now, but we'll end up having a positive effect in the, in the long run. So, yeah, what and, I would, what I would really like to see from this is like, you know, I want to see Amy Hennig maybe open her own studio and maybe take some ex visceral guys and ex naughty dog guys and kind of like bring them together and maybe form like a 40 man team that would really just crank out a really solid like it's similar to like what ninja theory did with hellblade you know a 30 40 dollar seven or eight hour story driven experience that is going to be critically acclaimed that is going to look great you know that's that's what i would love to see actually come out of this you know, I don't know how realistic that is, but like, I I could see it really happening and really kind of come together like that. You know, and you know, it's not going to be a Star Wars game, obviously, but it could be something really cool. It could be a pulpy Indiana Jones style adventure with cool characters and and great, you know, character interaction. That's that's that would be the dream right now to come out of this. Yeah. Well, everybody, we're yeah. going to leave it at that. Uh, once again, thank you for <laughs> tuning in to Arsenal X. Yeah, Ed has uh, to be at work in what, like three hours or something? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> you can find me on Twitter at that retro code. That's all I'm going to plug. Uh, Jesse, where can they find you at? You can find me at Twitter on at or, at Twitter at sub underscore humanist. 
Okay, and Corey, they can find you at on Twitter. You can find me at Corey and UHD on Twitter and Corey and HD on Instagram. If you guys can hear past episodes for more plugs and stuff like that, we have probably reached like the two and a half hour mark. Um, but we would like to let you, we would like to hear what you guys uh, have to say about EA or any of the stories that we covered. You can email us at arsenalx at gmail dot com. Is that correct, Corey? Yep, arsenalx podcast at gmail dot com. Oh. ArsenalXPodcast at gmail.com. And you can also leave a comment on our Facebook page of Arsenal X. And with that, everybody, we will see you next time on Arsenal X. Everybody, one last time to throw the X. Because <laughs> we just got done throwing down. Thank you, everybody. Have a great week. Have a great weekend. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. <laughs>